All right. So the way this is set up, hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, the way this is set up is webinar format, so we won't see any of the participants. Okay. But they are here. You can there. see them. Yeah. <laughs> In the attendees box. Hi, everybody. And uh, as always, if you want to say hello, let us know where you're calling from or watching from. Please do. That would be great. Let me see if I can get the live stream on Facebook started. Hello to somebody from Edmonton. All right, just setting up the live stream. All right, we are now also live on Facebook. And uh, right, to everybody hello. that just hopped in, hi guys. Hello everybody on Facebook. Yeah, feel free to let us know where you're watching from. Oh, hi Janine. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we will record this session and it will be available on Facebook and YouTube. Those are hello. Georgia, Sedona, Iowa. Oh, wow. All over the place. Hello, everybody. And uh, Margaret, whenever you're ready, the floor is all yours. Right. OK, so hi again, everybody from all over the world. Um, my name is Margaret, and today I'll be talking to you a little bit about sound systems um, in language documentation and also writing systems. Um, also known as phonology and orthography. So let me begin my uh, screen share here so that I can show you some slides. Get everything. Oops. Share sound. Go. Uh, All right. Everybody see this? Yep. All right, cool. So yeah, this is LDP workshop for phonology and orthography. Um, so first off, some of the objectives of this workshop. This is basically our goal here is to discuss some of the more practical aspects of sound systems or phonology for language documentation. So this is not meant to be a discussion of phonological theory. We're just gonna be going over some basics and how these might apply to your language documentation situation. Um, one of our other goals is to understand the concept of a language specific sound system. So every language has its own specific way that sounds pattern and work together and what sounds are meaningful versus not meaningful. So this is gonna be a very language specific um, thing. And when you're looking at a language that you're documenting, it's important to kind of realize that that language's phonology is going to be totally unique to itself. And in the second part of the workshop, we're gonna be talking about um, writing systems or orthography and how that can represent a sound system, how that can be a written form that represents the spoken language. Um, and this is gonna be a crucial information for just general documentation of a language. And also it's gonna be really important for language teaching, whether you're teaching a more widely spoken language or a language that doesn't have that. Either way, it's stuff that applies to any language. So continuing on here. So what is phonology? Broadly speaking, phonology encompasses something we call a phonemic inventory which is an inventory of all the sounds that a language considers contrastive. Um, something that would be contrastive in a language means that it can differentiate between two different words. And these are something that a speaker would consider to be two different sounds. Like a B sound in English is considered different from a P sound. Now, not all languages have the same contrast. So these are gonna depend on the language itself. Um, 
what counts as one sound, again, is going to depend on the speaker's perception of a single sound, a single individual phoneme in language. Generally, we divide sounds in a language um, into two big categories. Those include consonants that restrict the airflow in the mouth more, and vowels that shape the airflow, but they don't restrict it as much. Practice making a consonant like, I don't know, T. You can really tell that T stops all the airflow. So that's a bigger restriction than, say, ah, where you're not really restricted. Um, it's important to remember that there's a difference between sounds and letters. Um, a sound is something in a language that is basically heard or spoken, but doesn't necessarily correlate to a letter. Um, letters are what is going to be written. Now, sometimes those letters do represent sounds, but it's common, especially in some languages. Um, one sound might correspond to two or more letters. And likewise, a letter might correspond to two or more sounds. So this is not always a one-to-one -one relationship. So that's something to kind of watch out for when we continue talking about sounds versus writing. So for example, if we use English to look at this difference between sounds and letters, you can see that in this poem, there are a lot of interesting relationships between what you see written as a letter and what you hear as a sound. So for example, these words, the three first bolded words, C's, T's, and steeple, all include the same vowel sound, E. But as you can see, they're spelled using different letters. So this kind of illustrates the fact that letters and sounds don't always correspond one to one situation. Same thing with the next bolded letters, um, the next bolded words, you, who, and glue, um, all using the same sound, but once again, different letters. So it can be a bit confusing sometimes if you're learning to write or read a new language. Um, and even if you do know the language, um, when it's a writing system that's like English, it can be, um, it can really throw you off because we have so many inconsistencies between letter and sound. Um, so these are just some examples of this sort of effect in English, but English is not the only language or writing system that has this issue. Okay, so one kind of little exercise to pull apart the concept of sound versus letter is by looking at the series of, of words and trying to say the word forwards and then backwards, but not relying on the letters, but instead focusing on the sounds of the word. So if you have a word like shush, um, if you say it backwards, you just get shush, the same word basically, because it consists of two consonant sounds, sh and another sh, and then one vowel uh, in the middle. Um, for a word like meme, if you focus on the sound and reverse it, you once again get the sound meme because this E on the end is silent, right? Now, what about a word like fax? Um, if you focus on the letters, you might be a little confused, but if you just focus on sound, you just reverse the sounds in the opposite order, you get scab, right? Because we have a B sound, a, a K sound represented by two letters, and the final S sound. Same thing with skates. If you go backwards by sound rather than letter, you get stakes. Even though that's not how you spell the word stakes in English, the sound reversed makes that. So this is kind of just to illustrate the idea that we really want to separate sound from letter. Even though the two can be related, they're not always one. Okay. So yet again, another exercise that kind of points to this idea 
is trying to identify how many sounds are actually in words versus letters. Because it's easy to see how many letters are in these words, right? But if you think about pure sound, you have a different number in the end than if you were to think about letters. So for these following words, we have C, stick, X, and good. So we have three letters in C, but we have two sounds, S and E. And the E sound is made up by these two letters. Um, so once again, we have an imperfect relationship between each letter and each sound. And then is especially true in English orthography or English writing system is that it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence all of the time. So one of the ways that, um, that linguists deal with this issue, instead of using regular letters to represent each sound, like the letters of English or Italian or even like Japanese in type of languages writing system. We don't use those. We use something called the International Phonetic Alphabet. And this is really useful because it's a way for us to consistently represent the sounds of the language that is independent of the letters that may be or may not be used to write. So we always have a correspondence of one sound to one symbol and one symbol to one sound. So we don't have this issue of having to have two letters make one sound, one sound being able to be in different letter combinations, all that kind of nasty stuff. We can have just sort of a neat system to record and write down representations of different sounds. And one of the bonuses to this is that if you're familiar with the International Phonetic Alphabet or the IPA, um, you can sort of understand what each sound is going to be. So like in musical notation, if you see a piece of sheet music, you've never heard it before, but if you know how to read sheet music, you might be able to play it on the piano or you might be able to sing it. Uh, this is the sort of usefulness of the IPA. So I may not know a given language, but if I see a word represented in the IPA, I will get the gist of how to pronounce it. I may not have good pronunciation because I'm not a speaker of that language, but I will understand the basic sounds as they are. Whereas if I saw it written maybe in the orthography of this language, I would have no idea what the values of those letters were even supposed to be. Um, so the fact that the IPA is consistent is a really helpful thing about it, which makes it a really nice tool. Um, this is the consonant chart of the IPA, and you don't have to memorize this with all these symbols or anything, but it's just good to know like what the consonant chart is based on. So we have two dimensions here. We have the rows and columns. Each of the row, represents what we call a uh, manner of articulation. So that's like how the term or how the letter is said, how it's pronounced. Um, and each of the columns represents place of articulation. So that's where in the vocal tract this sound is being produced. So between the manner, how it's being done and the place where it's being done, we can specify different types of sound all over the world, of all the world's languages, basically. So any spoken language should be able to be, uh, have its sounds described using the International Phonetic Alphabet. Now, no language, no single language will have all of these sounds. Um, these are just all of the possible ones that we're aware of for human spoken. Um, if you see a pair of language in the same uh, cell, or you see a pair of letters rather, these symbols represent a voiceless and a voiced pair. So for a P, you don't activate your vocal cords, but for a V, you do activate them. So that's what the two pairs are. Uh, but once again, it's, there's a lot going on in this chart, so don't feel pressured to know what any of that means. Now the vowels, 
That was the consonant term. The vowels look a little bit different, right? They are not in sort of the exact same um, sort of layout in the chart. We had manner and place of articulation for consonants. But for the vowels, the different dimensions of this kind of trapezoid shape refer to whether the mouth is very open or closed when you articulate the vowel. So on this dimension, we have very open vowels like ah down here, and we have very closed vowels like e. So if you try saying those two different vowels, you can feel that your mouth is more or less open. So if you say ah, your mouth is open. If you say e, it's pretty closed. Now the other dimension here, besides open mouth versus closed, is the position of the tongue in the mouth. Whether your tongue is drawn to the back of the mouth or whether it is pushed forward to the back. So for a front vowel, like E once again, your tongue is going to be pushed all the way forward, E. But for U, it's going to be drawn all the way back. So if you say U, and you think about where your tongue is, it's pulled back, right? But if you say E, it's going to be torn. Um, now, in this case, the individual symbols are also in pairs, once again. But whereas on the consonant chart, that represented whether there was vocal cord action going or not, on the vowel chart, it refers to whether or not the lips are rounded when you pronounce the vowel. So on the left side of each pair, we have an unrounded vowel. So E, A, E, A, et cetera. No rounding happening in the lips. But on the right side, we have the rounded version. So U, O, 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 E, et cetera. Those are all pronounced with lip rounding. So that is where the pair sort of dynamic comes up, whether or not it's rounded or unrounded. So those are just sort of the basic ideas behind the two major charts of the IPA. And linguists use the IPA in order to make a consistent, objective, one-to-one -one corresponding sound to symbol transcription of a spoken word. So that is how this differs from your everyday writing system, which might get a little messy. So, if we were to take these words from earlier on, from the former slide, and think about their sounds, once again, rather than their letters, and we were to use these slashes, which the IPA often goes into their slashes or brackets, depending on the representation. Uh, and here we have an IPA transcription of the word C in English, consisting of two sounds, a consonant and a vowel. Once again, stick. You can see has four sounds in it, even though the CK is two letters, right? In English orthography, it's not a perfect correspondence. So that's going to be the main difference that you see in an IPA versus normal spelling. So this is an example of two letters actually making representing one sound. But here with the word mix, you actually have the opposite. In English, often X can represent two sounds together, the k and the s sound. So mix in IPA, you have to represent both of those sounds. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between sound and sound. So you can't leave anything out. Um, good, the word good is, a, is an example of what we call a digraph. And a digraph is just something where you have two letters, but they make one sound. They represent just one vowel sound, the uh, in English, even though you have two of them. So digraphs are really common in English. They're all over the place. The TH, for example, the TH spelling represents a single sound. And that's a digraph as well. So if you want to get more like um, I don't know, practice with the IPA chart or try so this interactive website, um, this interactive website is ipachart.com. Um, I will go here and show you how it looks. You can 
do this as well. I don't know if it'll, the sound will show up or not, but e. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but if you can, it basically pronounces every sound when you click on it. So you go through all the vowels. A. You can hear A. E. E. And then, you know, all of them. Um, so those are the vowels. Um, you can also look at the consonants right here. So you can go by manner of articulation, how the sound is formed, or you can go by place of articulation, where in the mouth, from the front of the lips all the way back down to the glottis, where is that sound being produced? And I'll give you an example of these sounds. Ma, a ma, ba, a ba, da, a da. And not all of these sounds are found in English, of course. Not all these sounds are found in any given individual language, but they are all possible. They all exist somewhere, in some language, or maybe many languages. So this is just kind of a tool ah, that you can use. Ah, ah. And this is probably the best like interactive website for the IPA, but there's tons of other websites out there that teach you the IPA if that's something you're interested in learning about. There's a lot of ways to use it, to learn it, to understand it. Um, but I won't go over all of it now since it's pretty big. Uh, but this is just the concept behind what the IPA is and why we use it as it is. Uh, okay. So I don't know if anybody, oh, here's the chat. Yep. Okay. Cool. I just wanted to check on anybody who's desperately trying to stop me. All right. So I'll continue on now. Um, another way that you can identify sounds in a language that contrast, that is sounds that make a difference in that language, is by looking for what are called minimal pairs. Now, minimal pairs are specific to a single language. So you have to look within the language that you're working on. Um, but you can do this with any language. So a minimal pair, also sometimes called a minimal set in some books. Um, basically what this is, is there are two words in the language that differ by only one sound, usually in the same position in the word, and those two words have different meanings. So for example, in English, some minimal pairs are bat versus pat. So the minimal pair there is between B and P. Um, book and cook, same sounds except for the beginning. And um, finally, there is sip and seat. And this makes the minimal pair focusing on the middle vowel sound. Um, and these words, as you can tell, if you know English, all have different meanings between them. Bat is not the same thing as pat. Book is not the same thing as cook. There's a different meaning. So you know that these are minimal pairs. And what this shows us is that each one of those sounds that differs for each word is important in that language. Because once you change that sound a little bit, it changes the whole word's meaning. So you know that that sound is crucial in that language. It contrasts in that language. And what that means is that they are considered phonemes. And phonemes are two sounds that make a crucial difference in a particular language. So if I were to say um, meat versus meat, one has an M, one has an N, you know that M and N contrast. You know that they are separate phonemes because when you say meat, it's not the same meaning as meat. Like you change something crucially about the word and it made it totally different. Um, so that is the basic concept behind the phoneme. But like I said, um, Different languages are going to have different contrasts. So in English, we have a difference of contrast between I, vowel, and E. So sit versus seat are crucially different. But in another language, that may not be the case. Maybe if you pronounce the word sit or seat, it's not really a difference in meaning. You're just pronouncing it a little differently. Maybe one or more is, one or the other is more or less like 
normal, pronounce that word, but it's not going to make a big difference in the meaning of the word. So when you think about contrasts, when you think about phonemes, mineral pairs, you have to go by the individual language that you're concerned with. Um, some more examples of minimal pairs. Um, in English, the L sound in leaf and the L sound in feel, uh, they don't contrast. They are considered both just L, right? But if you feel where your tongue is in your mouth, you can tell that they are actually technically different. A leaf, your tongue is up here by the T, that's an alveolar sound leaf, but if you say feel, you may feel the back of your tongue raising up toward the soft palate, feel, and they're technically pronounced differently. However, they don't contrast in English. English does not make a difference in words if you were to say leaf, right? It just is a different way of pronouncing leaf. Um, but those two sounds might contrast in some other language. I don't know what particular language that would be, but it would definitely not be English. Um, however, if you have an F sound as in leaf and the V sound as in leave, those two consonants, they do contrast because as you can see, leaf, leave have different meanings. However, once again, that might not be the case for another language. And the fact that phonemes have different statuses and there are different contrasts that either do or don't matter in two languages is one of the reasons that if you're learning another language, it might be really difficult to learn all these new contrasts because they either do or don't apply to your new language. I think somebody had a hand raised. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, just put them in the chat. I now know mm -hmm. how to see the chat. <laughs> There was a question pretty far back up. Uh, Tessie oh, yeah. asked, why inconsistency of letters and sounds, especially in English? That's a really good question. Um, it's very uh, confusing, I think. Um, when you're learning a language or you know a language with an inconsistent spelling system, it just seems like a big pain, and it is. And one of the reasons, it's got a long, complicated answer, but one of the reasons for English is the fact that over time, the language, the sound system of the language has changed. However, the writing doesn't necessarily change as fast as the sounds do. So language is fluid and always changing, right? Sounds are being, um, the, the contrasts and the different specifications of how language is pronounced is a very changeable thing over the decades and centuries and everything. But writing systems usually don't change very fast. Um, in fact, some spellings are centuries old and they no longer really reflect uh, pronunciation as it currently is. Another thing about English in particular, although this could apply to some other languages as well, is that English has words from so many different other language sources and those words were often spelled differently from each other when they were sort of borrowed into English. And so you get this very confusing amalgamation of different writing systems being changed or not changed and all entering the same language confusingly. And you get a really confusing orthography or a really inconsistent orthography. And uh, that type of orthography is often referred to as an opaque orthography. So if you can think about the meaning of opaque, meaning not clear, not transparent, you can't really see why things are spelled the way they are in a language like English, unless you know the specific history of the specific word and how it used to be pronounced and all that stuff. It's, yeah, it's totally confusing. Um, so newer systems, newer writing systems that are invented like more recently tend to have less of that because they just haven't had as much time to get confusing in the ways that I talked about. Uh, they tend to be a little easier to learn. Uh, so if you notice, like not all languages have this extreme problem that English got. So but that's a really good question. 
basically it's history and language change and spelling can't keep up basically what it is um oh what would the ip symbols for the l in leaf and feel be that's a good question so they are different as we discussed technically although english does not contrast them so if i go back up to my ipa let me show you so the l in leaf the alveolar um it is a lateral approximate, so it's going to be right down here, this L. Um, if you make a L that is more toward the back of the mouth, but not totally in the back, maybe your front part of your tongue is still up there just a bit, of, a little bit, it actually is going to be an L with a kind of squiggly line written through it, like a tilde. I don't know if I can make it on my computer here. Uh, sometimes I can. I, if I get my, hmm, there we go. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. I think that might be the sh. I can't tell. But anyway, it basically looks like an L with a tilde through it. And that's called the velarized L, which means it's an L that's pronounced back toward the velum or the soft palate, back to the back of the mouth. So if you were to pronounce it normally as leaf, which is a typical pronunciation, um, you would just have leaf like that. But if you were to use the ul in feel, you go leaf, which is not a typical pronunciation in my dialect at least. Um, but feel at the end of a consonant or at the end of a syllable like that, you do see that what they call dark L, which is really just an L pronounced a little bit farther back. Yeah, I can't find it on my keyboard either because I, I recently changed my keyboard and now everything's confusing. So, oops. Oops, sorry about that, folks. Margaret will be back in just a second. I think we have a technical issue. Uh, and I see your question, Tara. I will point it out to Margaret when she gets back because that is also an excellent question. Uh, hopefully, she'll be rejoining. Yep, there we go. Uh oh. Just hey like there. I knocked myself out of the webinar somehow. Let's fix it. Let's put me back. I don't know what I pushed, but I was trying to make an L and then suddenly I was gone. <laughs> the dangers of IPA keyboards. The dangers of, yeah, of pushing option on your bad keyboard that did something <laughs> wrong. Sorry. Oh, oops. Oh, yeah. Uh, is everybody else seeing Margaret okay? Your video is okay for me, but Joy says it's robotic and the picture's oh. frozen. I don't want that. Okay, better now. Okay. Awesome. Okay, uh, sorry. Also, you may have missed this question. Tara had a really interesting one. How does it work for sounds that don't exist within the IPA system? I'm going to hand that over really to you. Question. Yeah, so... Okay, I just pinned myself. Um, that's a really good question. So sounds that don't exist in the IPA. Um, a lot of times, if you have a sound that is not, it's it's so precise and you don't have a, a, a symbol in the IPA chart, there is a series of diacritics and extra little marks that you can add. So if I share my screen again, Let's see here. I want to, oops. I want to share my sound. Okay, I think that's fine. Here's the IPA chart. So um, if you can see this, uh, there are a lot of different little, uh, I don't know if they have it on here, but anyway, there are a lot of different diacritics that you can add to your IPA symbols and they modify it in slight ways so if like like the velarized l is basically representing an l that is partially still alveolar partially up by your teeth but also has the back of the tongue raised toward the velum it's not totally velar that would be like this sound la, a la. not quite that but it's somewhere in between so we use the sort of tilde diacritic through the middle of the L to indicate that. 
Now, there is another issue with that, though, however, that I think pertains to this question. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, I think it also pertains to your question is that um, there are places in the IPRA chart, if I go back to the slide, that have a symbol, but it's kind of grayed out. And these are sounds that are technically possible to produce for most human beings. However, they are not attested to be contrastive in any human language that we're aware of. Um, that means that it may exist, you may be able to pronounce it, but we don't know if it's a phony. We don't know if for example, there is a retroflex lateral fricative that contrasts with, for example, a non-retroflex alveolar lateral fricative. We don't know if that makes a difference in any language today. We may find out later that it does, which has happened um, many times throughout linguistics um, brief existence as it is, that we do find a language that contrasts a particular sound and you have to add it to the IPA. So for example, if you look at this symbol, like this V with a little hook right there, that V with a little hook actually was added, I think in, was it 1995? I think, I could be wrong about that. But it was added to the IPA um, and it wasn't on there before. But as we learn more and more about other languages that are out there in the world, we have to add sounds to the IPA. Uh, but that's kind of a longer answer than you're probably looking for. But um, there are several ways to address that issue of my sound might not be on the IPA. Uh, okay, let's see. Yeah. Uh, can a single sound be named two different names? Um, not typically. Um, I think usually the nomenclature, like how we name, how we describe a sound is more or less the same. There are some differences between different traditions in linguistics. Like for example, um, like uh, calling a stop either a plosive or a stop, it's the same meaning. It's just two different words that mean the exact same thing. But generally, um, a single sound will have the same kind of description, the same like phonetic description. Like here's where it is in the mouth. This is how it's made. This is whether or not the vocal cords are engaged or not. So uh, it says, oh, uh, have Salish and languages forced linguists to add any new letters? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure about that one. I think. Um, I think that the last one that they added was the labiodental flap, but I'm not 100% sure. There's an entire uh, um, organization based around the IPA, so um, they kind of are the ones who add new official symbols to it. Uh, but that's a really good question. Uh, I think it changes rather slowly still. Uh, anyway, I will continue on. Uh, with the slides. So we talked about minimal pairs. Um, some more examples of minimal pairs in languages. We have Hindustani um, contrasts between dental stops versus retrosplex stops. Um, there's an example if you want to listen to it on the phonology page, the Wikipedia page for Hindustani phonology. And this is talking about the difference between a dental stop made behind the teeth, like the, and a retroflex stop where the tongue is actually curled backwards a little bit, like the. So those two sounds would contrast in this language, but this would not be a contrast that is going to be seen in English most of the time. So I don't know if I can, hopefully the uh, sound share is picking up some of this, but if it's not, you can feel free to go to the website too. Um, so here's a four-way contrast between different types of P and B sounds. So these are some bilabial stops. Pal, pal, bal, bal. So the differences between these stops are contrasting for this language. So they can they contrast different words. So we've got a minimal pair set here, or a minimal set, because there's four different terms. And for each one of these words, 
there is a different meaning. So you know that for this language, the differences between these stops is a contrast. So here are some dental stops. Tal, tal, dal, dhar. And that contrasts with the retroflex stops down here. Tal, tal, dal, dhal. Yeah, applicable link. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, the IPA has always grown based on linguists learning about new kinds of sounds. Absolutely. And so if we don't know how other languages work in any given language, we can't use that language. We cannot have a fully complete IPA, right? We can't, uh, we don't know everything. Uh, English, W, bilingual. Yeah, so bilabial proximate labial velar, usually a W is in some languages has the tongue raised toward the back. So sometimes it's considered to be both labial with the lips and velar with the back of the tongue. Yes, and what Anna said is true. If you can't perceive the difference, it may be because in the languages that you're familiar with, these contrasts are not there, right? So if um if you are a native English speaker, it might be kind of in, unintuitive to think that the L in leaf, and the L in feel are technically different sounds, right? Because we don't think about them as big. And that's because they're not phonemes, separate phonemes in English. Uh, but anyway, these are some more examples of minimal stops in different languages. Um, okay, back to this slide. Yeah, so these are all making differences. All right. Another thing that counts for some languages in terms of um, tone, uh, in terms of minimal pairs can be tone. Um, the different tones of a language like Cantonese or Mandarin um, will also differentiate different kinds of um, words and different meanings. So if you have a particular tone chosen in some languages, it can differentiate the meaning of the word. So this works the same way that contrasts between different consonants or vowels might work. Oh, and a question um, looks like from the Q&A box. What do I mean by Hindustani phonemes? So by phonemes, I mean that they are different sounds in the Hindustani language that can contrast to make different meanings in the word. So saying pal versus bal will change the meaning as was in the example. And so that is basically the meaning of like a different phoneme is that it's contrasted. It makes a difference in a word, change the meaning. Uh, but yeah, so tone, can also be one of those things that makes a difference. Now, not all languages have what we call lexical tone, but some languages do. In fact, it may be quite a high percentage of languages throughout the world have a tone like this. Um, and some languages like Cantonese will have six tones. Some languages can have fewer tones. Others might have two tones, like some languages in Africa have two tones. Um, so that is another thing that you sort of perceive in a language that might make a difference between meanings of words. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, sign languages. So signed languages also have phonology, even though they're not, it doesn't consist of actual sound, but it does consist of different kinds of elements that work in the same kinds of patterns as we see in other phonologies. So instead of something like, place of articulation or manner of articulation that we saw in the IPA chart, the things that contrast phonemes or phonological contrast in a sign language are going to be different kinds of elements. So these might be location, like where you actually do the sign, um, the hand shape, uh, orientation, like whether your hands are facing away or toward you, um, movement, 
what type of movement is involved in the sign. And also non-manual expression. This is something that is an expression that is not involving the hands. It might involve the face, for example. So these are all ways that sign language can contrast different signs in the way that spoken languages contrast with themselves. Um, for example, um, in ASL, a minimal pair um, is two signs, right, that are going to contrast by one of these five elements. So in ASL, we have the two sign for sh uh, funny and for sugar. And these are the same sign except for their location. So just like in spoken language, like English, we have a minimal pair. It's two sets of two words that differ just by one sound in one position. These two signs differ just by their location, where they're actually done. Um, so let's see if I can show you these since I am not a user of sign language. Let's see. So this is the sign for funny. As you can see, it's done kind of right over the nose mouth area. Um, and if we look at sugar. This location is a little bit lower. So a little bit lower down by the chin. So this is a minimal pair in ASL, American Sign Language. So as you can see, there is a phonological aspect to these differences, just like there was to uh, the minimal pairs we looked at from spoken languages. Uh, so that's location contrast. We also have um, minimal pairs that are based on hand shape. So hand shape is the thing that changes these, the term for white versus the term for light. Here's white. And let's look at like. A convention opens uh -oh. Alaska's. Here's an ad. I didn't think there would be an ad. Okay, so <clears throat> the hand shape is different between like and like. Um, orientation is demonstrated uh, between the words for thing and children. So that's where the hand is turned, like when they're turned So here's thing. Um, and children. So orientation, right? Turn, hands turn. Um, so these are some minimal pairs in sign language. Um, there's another video here, uh, which will be in the slides if you want to go watch more examples of minimal pairs. Um, so uh, I want to move on past uh, this to just sort of open up the floor to anybody who's got further questions about this stuff that we've been uh, talking um, about so far. Yeah, thank you for putting in the website there, the sign language website. Does anybody have any questions about things we've covered so far? Um, this is where I wanna make sure everything is relatively clear, concepts about what is a phoneme, what is a contrast, um, IPA usage, any of that kind of stuff. Um, if not, uh, feel free to add your questions just as we go. Um, I'm going to start talking about orthography, which is spelling and writing systems, and how that can relate to phonology, or as the case may be, not relate to it for some languages. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to drop them in the chat right there. I will try to check it periodically to make sure I'm not all. Okay, so the second part of this uh, workshop is talking about orthography. So 
Orthography is a writing system that is specific to some language. So when we talk about English orthography, we're talking about the writing system, the spelling system specific to English, which might not be and is in fact not the same as the orthographies for other languages. Um, when you talk about orthography in general, um, it just kind of refers to writing and spelling conventions um, that exist out there. Um, it is considered by many people really important to have an orthography in a different language. And that's for many different um, reasons. And some of those reasons might be that a writing system uh, can create cohesion within a community if everybody agrees on it. This is not always the case. People don't always agree in orthography. In fact, it is one of the areas of the language that can be very um, contentious sometimes. But um, it's also one of the parts of the language that tends to be viewed with respect. It can lend a sense of prestige to a language if there is a writing system for it. Um, that's one of the other reasons that um, it can be considered important within it. Let's see, a question came in. Is there a program or app where we can record utterances? Then we can see transcription in IPA. Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not aware of anything like that that exists. It does. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, learning to transcribe into IPA is kind of a, a skill that you have to sort of develop over time, and it can be very dependent on what language you're using and what if you're familiar with the sounds of that language and things like that. But that's a really interesting idea. Um, if anybody knows of anything that exists like that out there, I don't know, I feel like it would have to be some sort of an advanced AI situation. maybe, Because um, of course, humans can make all sorts of sounds that are not language, right? So it might be difficult if you were to make some of those sounds, like what if you just coughed into it? Would it interpret that as something? What, what sounds are you making here in your language? I'm like, well, none, it was just a cough. Um, but that is a really interesting idea. Um, yeah, that would kind of be the holy grail for language documenters. We wouldn't have to transcribe our own recordings anymore. I know. And even just for other linguists, like, oh, um, that's, you know, <laughs> you could have, a, you could record somebody and then you would just have the whole transcription and you'd be like, oh, okay, I wonder what the phonemes of this language are. And then it's just easier to figure that out, maybe. <laughs> but that's, um, it should be, yeah, I mean, it would, it, it sounds very difficult, but I'm sure somebody has tried to do it somewhere. I don't know. Um, maybe someday. But it, for the time being, we still have human beings who have to transcribe stuff. <laughs> yeah, time to start a project. <laughs> um, anyway, um, anyway, back to orthography. Uh, right, so there are many reasons why orthographies might be important for a language. Um, they're often seen additionally as being prestigious or uh, creating community cohesion. They're seen as better for education for school environments. Um, and uh, just for general communication, written communication between speakers. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons that you might want to have an orthography. Um, there are many different kinds of orthography um, across uh, the world's languages. There is kind of three main categories. Uh, one is called logographic, one is called a syllabary, and one is called alphabet. So I'll take a look at some examples of the three major categories of orthography. Um, a logographic system and might be exemplified by something like the Chinese writing system. Uh, the basic principle of this is that there is one symbol for every morpheme. And a morpheme you can think of as like a unit of meaning or a chunk of meaning. Um, that's kind of the very simplified version of how it works. Um, it One of the caveats is that it can take a long time to learn if you've ever studied a language that is not your native language where you had to learn, for example, a lot of kanji if you're learning Japanese or something like that. It can take you quite a long time. When I studied Japanese, I took an entire course just on learning basically the logographic writing system. So you need to know a lot of them. 
because for every morpheme, you might have a totally new symbol. Um, so there's some just examples of sort of the concepts behind those. Now, the next system that is sort of a major category is a syllabary. The concept behind this is you might have one symbol for every syllable in the language. And if you ever struggle to find out what a syllable is, well, it's not entirely straightforward all the time. But one kind of easy way of doing it is to tap out how many syllables are in the word. So if I take an English word like elephant, and I tap, I go elephant, and I've tapped three times. So that is some indication that there might be three syllables in the word. And there are. Um, if I tap out the word for syllabary, I go syllabary, and that's four syllables. Um, this type of system is used in Japanese hiragana and katakana. Um, uh, it is easier to use this kind of system with a language that has simpler syllable structure. Because if you have like 500 possible syllables in your language with complex structure, you have to learn 500 symbols to go with it. But if you have simpler syllables and you don't have as many possibilities, you don't have to have as many symbols to learn. So the simpler your syllable structures, the easier it probably will be to use a syllabary. So if I were to use a syllabary for English, it would be a big learning task because I'd have to learn all these different types of syllable possibilities. Um, but with Japanese, for example, it's not the case. Uh, now, probably the most common orthography system type is the alphabet which most people are familiar with to some degree. Um, the basic principle is that we have one syllable per phoneme. But as we all know and have discussed already, that's not always the case. There's a ton of exceptions for that, including what I referred to previously as digraphs, which are when you have two letters in your alphabet that represent a single sound. Um, so English, as well as other alphabetic systems, are full of these. They're full of inconsistencies for a variety of reasons. Um, but it doesn't stop it from being usually like the most common form of orthography that is out there. And often when a language develops an orthography, they may use a form of an alphabet. So you might use the Roman alphabet, like English, Italian, French. They all be they all use the Roman alphabet. You might use the Greek alphabet. You might use Cyrillic alphabet, um, depending on various choices. So which ones you have for you. Um, but yeah, these are the three basic big categories of orthography. But what if your language doesn't have an official orthography? Well, you can always work on developing a working orthography. So that's something that you just use for your writing purposes, even though it may not be official or sanctioned by, you know, governmental body or anything like that. But if you need one, you can always uh, kind of ad hoc it. You can always just kind of make it up as you go along. But there are some things to keep in mind about developing an orthography. When you start off, it's a lot easier to learn it and keep track of it if you start off with a one sound to one symbol correspondence. And we talked about how confusing English orthography can be because that is not the case, right? We don't have one sound to one symbol correspondence all the time. And that makes it confusing. But if you do, that can be a starting point for developing an alphabetic orthography. Um, Something else to think about, especially in this era, is making the writing system compatible with technology, like computers and phones. Um, if you were to make a really complex, completely new system, you might not have 
um, the fonts, or you might not have the ability to type in that. So that's going to limit who is able to use it for what purposes. And someone says, could any official language use IPA symbols as a sort of So the answer is, you could, yes. I'm not aware of an orthography that is just IPA symbols, only IPA symbols, but there are a lot of symbols in different orthographies that are also the same as in the IPA. And I think some of the languages of like BC and the Pacific Northwest of the US have some symbols from the IPA in particular that are used also in the orthography to represent a similar sound. But as far as I'm aware, there isn't an official orthography that just takes all the IPAs. However, when you're starting off documenting a language, for example, it makes a lot of sense to transcribe it into IPA, especially if there is no orthography that you know of to work with. And it's honestly kind of the first step, even if there is um, an orthography. Oh, yeah. And I'm talking about yes. And Right, so e, o, and n use the same sound. So those are IPA symbols, but they're also symbols in the orthography. Yeah, and they can be useful additions. Yeah, the language that I work with um, called Kala in Papua New Guinea um, has uh, nasalized vowels like on versus a uh, and on. And we ended up using um, the tilde over top of the vowels to represent that, which is the same way the IPA does it. It's just... Can we really say that this particular writing system is appropriate for a specific language and the writing system is not appropriate for that language? Um, yeah, I mean, you could use any kind of system to represent any language, it's possible to do. It's more of like a choice that you have what is going to be better for our learning? What is going to be more practical for use? What are people more likely to be comfortable with? There's a lot of consideration. So it's not so much that it's impossible to use a given writing system for a given language. It's more just like a series of complicated choices. That you have. And orthography development is like one of the most complex areas that I've ever had anything to do with. It's incredibly determined by social things, um, social decisions and political decisions. It can be really complex. Um, so it's not so much that well, you can never use the Latin alphabet for this, but it may be more suited for various reasons. And that's something that speaker communities decide. You know, um, It often has to do with history too. So mentioning that, uh, some languages in Ethiopia use Latin alphabet and some use Ethiopic script is a great example, right? It's not that it's impossible to use the other. Theoretically, you could, but it just isn't that way. And in choosing orthography, it can be very complicated. Huh. Oh, yeah, talking about Hango. Yeah, so it's very well tailored to the sounds of Korean. But it might not work out as well for another language, but people might try, right? Uh, to varying degrees of success. So it's kind of a complex decision and choice and can have many factors. In I once listened to elders talk for nearly two hours about how a single syllable sound would change the entire meaning of the whole sentence. Yeah. Orthography is something that's usually like very important to people. That is like very crucial and meaningful to people. Um, so it can be quite the nuanced topic, uh, especially when you develop an orthography, like something doesn't exist, could be something new. It can be very complex. Um, on that note, some questions to think about with regard to orthography. Um, if your language does have an orthography, is this a universally accepted system by all speakers or not? A lot of times it may not be um, based on differences of opinion within a community. 
or differences of dialects may disagree about how to spell things. Um, different dialects, regions, varieties of language um, can really influence how people feel about the spelling. And as Anna says, orthography wars. It's definitely true. People can be, it can be a heated topic, basically. Uh, and very uh, different, differing opinions, very controversial like, uh, topics with it. Um, if you are thinking about developing an orthography for a given language, um, it's important to think about like what features of the language might present some challenges to the development. Like, for example, if you have a language that has tone, um, how will you represent tone, if you will, at all? Um, if you have any like contributing social factors, probably so. You know, there are um, issues with um, people agreeing or not on whether an orthography is even good or useful, or people even wanting to use it or not. Um, and for a given uh, language, there may be different systems in use. Like I have approached languages sometimes trying to um, understand the phonology and orthography only to find that like different people who've written about the language have used totally different ways to spell it. And then it threw me off because I had to learn like two or three different systems just to be able to understand what was going on in the writing. Um, so that can be, you know, an issue as well. It's like different systems used at different times, different preferences for speakers of different ages or generations or different like social groups. So it can be one of the most complicated things about, about you know, language documentation or conservation in some the orthography. So um, that is all I have for slides today. Uh, and I would like to turn it over to anybody else who wants to ask a question in the chat or wants to ask about these slides. The slides should be available. Um, this is all being recorded, so you can access it later, too. And um, also, you can feel free to contact me for any reason if you want to. Um, I will put my email address just so that you can. I don't know, say whatever you wanted to say. Um, this is my email down there. If you have any reason or wish, feel free to shoot me a message about it. But I think I will stop my screen share now and just check, make sure I didn't lose any questions through here. It was pretty active chat. Um, but yeah, I, Overall, that's pretty much all I've got. Um, so thanks everybody for listening. And hope you. Uh, oh, you didn't. Oh, you didn't see it. Oh dear. Let's see. Oh, I, I. Okay, I see. I just showed it to some people. There you go. That should be to everybody. So hopefully you can see that. So. Yep. That is all I've got today for you on. Sounds and writing, orthology and orthography. So I hope everybody enjoyed that, learned a couple new things, and has some new thinking material for language documentation concepts. So thanks everybody for listening, and thanks for all your great questions and comments about language. And I'm really enjoying reading back through some of these other comments about whatever languages around you are doing. Really cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Margaret. This was an awesome session. I always really enjoy your phonology oh. workshops. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And thanks, yeah. everybody, for tuning in, whatever time it is, where you are. Thanks for being here with us this morning or evening or afternoon or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. And next week, we've got more exciting stuff to learn about. We're going to be talking about morphology, which is how pieces of a word fit together, and syntax, which is how words fit together to make sentences. So tune in next week. Thank you, Margaret. Big round of applause yep. for you. Yep. Take care, Thank everybody. everybody. Yep. See you next time. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.